everyone. I'm Lindsay Reiser at the CBS Broadcast Center, and we are continuing to follow breaking news that President Joe Biden is stepping down from the 2024 race for the White House. He made the announcement on social media just before 2 p.m. Eastern Sunday. In a statement, he said, quote, while it has been my intention to seek reelection, I believe it is in the best interest of my party and the country for me to stand down. The president says he plans to address the nation later this week to explain his decision in more detail. He is currently isolating in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, recovering from COVID. In a separate post on social media, President Biden endorsed his vice president, Kamala Harris. He said his first decision as the party nominee in 2020 was to pick Harris as VP, and he described it as the best decision he's made. He also called on his fellow Democrats to, quote, come together and beat Trump. Reaction from Democratic lawmakers has been pouring in. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, quote, Joe Biden has not only been a great president and a great legislative leader, but he is a truly amazing human being. He went on to say Biden once again put his country, party and future first. Biden's former boss, former President Barack Obama, also expressed his gratitude Sunday. In a statement, Obama said Biden has been, quote, one of America's most consequential presidents. He also said he knows Biden wouldn't make the decision to step aside unless he believed it was right for the country. Former president and official Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump also responded to Biden's announcement. On Truth Social, Trump said Joe Biden is not fit to run and not fit to serve. In a phone conversation with CBS News, Trump said it's good for the country that Biden is stepping aside. He said he thinks Kamala Harris is no better than him. We have team coverage of this political shakeup. Willie James Inman is at Biden's Delaware home. Nancy Cordes is at the White House. Nicole Killian is on Capitol Hill, but we start with John Dickerson here in Studio 57. John is a CBS News senior political analyst. He's also the anchor of The Daily Report with John Dickerson here on CBS News 24-7. Help put this into historical context for us. Is this the day we're all going to remember where we were? I think that's true, um, in part because presidents don't give up power willingly. And also, there's never been a president who has dropped out this late in the race. And that's not just a date on the calendar. President Biden has the nomination essentially locked up. When LBJ dropped out in 1968, he didn't. What that means is the Democratic Party was really far down the track. And and that means there's just extra amounts of complexity. So this is a shocking earthquake, but the reverberations and aftershocks are still going to be felt for a while. What do you portend for the future of the Democratic Party? The RNC, uh, Republicans are kind of leaving the RNC with the wind at their sails. They've sort of touted this unity message, which which you, of course, have covered as well. And that unity is not just saying we all have to be unified for Trump. Um, But do you see the Democratic Party coalescing behind Harris or do you see a fight? The clock is ticking. The minute Joe Biden announced that he wasn't going to be running, a unity pressure started on the Democratic Party. But there's a countervailing pressure, which is those people who wanted Joe Biden to stay in the race and who feel like the elites, the party powerful, the media shoved him out of the race. They have sensitive feelings which need to be tended to. So how do you push to unity fast without pushing so fast that you end up bruising feelings even further? And that's important because you need the party to get to the place of unity that the Republican Party is so that then they can prosecute the case and try and win over the persuadable voters if they're out there. So the clock is ticking. How long it will take, we'll we'll see. The move to Harris has been pretty fast. We'll see over the next couple of days. Jamie Harrison saying he was still emotional over the decision. Ron Klain, Biden's former chief of staff, sort of had that slight bitterness and tone in his statement. Now, how will this work in the future in terms of Biden's war chest, in terms of the campaign switching? We know that campaign workers were told you still have a job tomorrow. It, it is much easier if it goes to Harris. Um, if it is not going to go to Harris, a process has to be put in place to, um, well, a process may have to be put in place no matter what so that Harris can earn the nomination. What exactly that means is left to be determined. As a candidate, you want to earn it because you want people to be invested in you. And so there's a reason that Harris used the word earn the minute she responded to this news. Um, But it's easier for Harris because her name is on the ticket with Biden to get the money. So that's a very, very important part of her her candidacy and why uh, there's been this support behind her for it. Um, And another candidate would have to, first of all, arrive. We haven't in all these conversations that have been taking place since this news came out. Nobody has said, well, it could be X. There is no X at the moment. Democrats like to say they have a deep bench. Well, they might, but the clock is ticking. 
And that bench has to, somebody has to emerge as an alternative because they've got to get lawmakers behind them. They've got to get voters behind them. They've got to move. And the fact that one has not emerged yet gives you a sense of how difficult it would be for someone to emerge. And it would also be a good look for Harris or whoever the nominee is to earn that because Republicans are going to seize on that and call it, as many have, a coronation. Sure. They will call it a coronation. I think at the end of the day, um, if, if the if Democrats will prosecute a message. And the Republicans will say what they're going to say about a coronation. And uh, if the Democrats are successful, nobody will, will care, really, because they will have been successful in prosecuting the case for why they deserve power and why Donald Trump doesn't. If, if, it's, if, if the coronation criticism works with Democrats, it will work because they, they basically can't make an alternative case. They can't speak to those larger issues. So if the, if, the candidate, if the presidency is determined on, like, the internal rules of the Democratic Party, then the Democrats have failed to, give, to make a larger claim for the public. So they're, they're doomed if it becomes about the internal workings of the Democratic Party. What about some of the far-right voices saying if he's not fit to run, he's not fit to serve? Is that going to go anywhere? Well, it'll stick the White House. It'll, it'll, it'll bedevil the Democratic campaign because it's twinned with a second... Uh, point, which is, wait a minute, what did you know and when did you know it about whether the president, President Biden, was fit to serve? Democrats will say the point was, was that he can't go for another four years, and so now is the time to take on Donald Trump and give, you know, and I imagine some of them will start to say, so that people can make their choice about Kamala Harris, who will be the next president. So give them that opportunity to actually make the to choice, not just be handed off to her in a second term. Um, but I think that Republicans will pin the Democrats down on that, and Democrats are going to have to come up with a good answer. John Dickerson, thank you. CBS News White House reporter Willie James Inman is outside the president's home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Um, good to see you. What can you tell us about what's been happening behind the scenes and what discussions led up to this bombshell announcement today? Hey there, Lindsay. Good to be with you. Well, President Biden, as you mentioned, is here at his beach home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, and he has been recovering from COVID out of public view since last Wednesday evening. And it was late last night that we learned, according to a source familiar, that President Biden started to come to this decision. He huddled with his advisors. And today he made those important phone calls, not only to his campaign chair, Jen O'Malley Dillon, but he also called the vice president and his chief of staff as well before he made this decision. That decision went out, as you you know, as you noted, uh, just before 2 p.m., and it was shortly after that, about 30 minutes or so, where we saw the president endorse the vice president to be the next nominee for the Democratic Party. So a lot of moving parts, a lot of conversations that were going on behind the scenes. I'll also note uh, that the, not only were, was the president making phone calls today to uh, essentially talk about this decision, the vice president was making phone calls as well, working the phones, trying to gather up support for her nomination to be the next president of the United States if she were to be successful this November. Uh, but still, this is just sending political shockwaves, as you and John were just talking about, across the nation with the president bowing out of the race, uh, bowing to that pressure that we've been seeing grow with some three dozen, more than three dozen Democrats coming out and saying that the president should step aside, Lindsay. William in Inrojo with Beach, Delaware. Thank you. Joe Biden is grounded. He's grounded in his faith, in his family, and in our state. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, this was a very difficult decision and one that I think reflects the very best of who Joe Biden is. Um, someone who, as you put it, Bob, um, comes home, comes home because it's where his strength is. His strength is in his family. His strength is in our community. His strength is in his faith. That was Democratic Senator Chris Coons getting emotional earlier on CBS News and reacting to news that President Biden was stepping down for the 2024 election and endorsing his vice president, Kamala Harris. CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes joins us from the White House. Uh, Nancy, what has been the reaction so far to Biden's endorsement of Harris? Well, among Democrats, there has been an outpouring of gratitude to uh, the president for A, coming to this decision, and B, for uh, having a, a, what they view as a very successful first term uh, as president. They acknowledge that this was not an easy decision for him, uh, nor, would it would, nor would it be for anyone. We've uh, seen an equal magnitude of support for 
the vice president, Kamala Harris, as the presumptive nominee. In fact, almost everyone uh, in Congress who was calling on President Biden to step aside has now uh, come out in support of Vice President Harris. And so she is full steam ahead, Lindsay. In fact, just a few moments ago, the first fundraising text from Vice President Harris as the presumptive nominee went out. She said, I'm running to be president of the United States. I'm honored to have the president's endorsement, and my intention is to earn and win this nomination. She says she's going to hit the campaign trail in the coming days, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Will you pitch in your first $20 today to elect me as president of the United States and defeat Donald Trump? So uh, there you have it. Within just a few hours, she is now taking on the mantle of presumptive nominee, even as we are starting to get uh, our first indication that there is at least one person who might try to challenge her for that nomination. That is the uh, independent senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. He was, of course, a Democrat. He's now an independent. We're told he may be considering returning to the Democratic Party so that he could mount a challenge for the nomination. We'll see if that uh, comes to fruition or not. So that said, who would be some VP contenders that are part of the conversation right now on a Harris ticket? Well, uh, the, you hear the most talk about governors from battleground states. Uh, and there are several of them to choose from. There is Roy Cooper. He is the governor of North Carolina. There's Josh Shapiro. He is the governor of Pennsylvania. We know that uh, both President Biden and Vice President Harris spoke to Shapiro today uh, about the decision. Uh, then there's Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan. And then another name you hear a lot is Senator Mark Kelly, who's from another battleground state. Arizona. So uh, those are some names you hear bandied about, but it's certainly not limited to those names. Uh, we've also heard talk of Andy Bashir, the governor of Kentucky. Uh, it's a long list of about 10 different names that gets discussed. And uh, Vice President Harris now has only a few weeks uh, to make a decision before the Democratic convention comes up in August. From the White House, thank you. Reactions have been pouring in from Capitol Hill. Before Biden made that decision, there were more than three dozen Democratic lawmakers calling for him to step aside. Several senators who are facing tough reelection campaigns in their home states, like John Tester and Sherrod Brown, joined those calls in recent days. The chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Susan Delbonet of Washington, praised the president's decision to exit the race, calling him, quote, the most con consequential president in modern history. She added his legacy will be one of principled leadership with a focus on families and communities. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, quote, Joe Biden has not only been a great president and a great legislative leader, but he is a truly amazing human being. He went on to say Biden once again put his country, party and future first. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries said, quote, President Biden is one of the most accomplished and consequential leaders in American history. America is a better place today because President Joe Biden has led us with intellect, grace and dignity. In contrast, Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York said, quote, if Joe Biden can't run for reelection, he is unable and unfit to serve as president of the United States. He must immediately resign. Let's bring in CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian. So, Nicole, what other notable congressional reaction are you following? Well, I think you summarized most of it. I mean, look, you know, one thing I would point out is that in terms of some of the congressional leaders that we have heard from, you know, while much of their statements have been in praise of the president, uh, they have not necessarily uh, endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris, whereas we have seen more rank and file members uh, do the same. I would also note that in terms of congressional Republicans, as you pointed out with uh, Congresswoman Stefanik or GOP Conference Chair Stefanik's statement, uh, there are a number of uh, congressional Republicans who believe that the president should resign. Uh, that being said, uh, there are other more sympathetic Republicans like Mitt Romney who uh, praised the work of the president and said that he felt that he made the right decision but didn't go as far as some of his Republican colleagues. Uh, one thing I would also note is that we know that the vice president has really been working the phones uh, for the better part of the day, uh, reaching out and speaking with a number of 
of congressional members and leaders, everyone from uh, Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries uh, to the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and other chairs of what is called the Tri Caucus, the chair of the Hispanic Congressional Hispanic Caucus, as well as uh, Judy Chu, who heads KPAC, which is the organization for uh, Asian American lawmakers. Uh, in addition to that, we know that the vice president has also spoken with the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, as well as the chair of the New Democrat Coalition, which makes up a broad swath of uh, Democratic members in the House, uh, Congresswoman Annie Custer. So she has been, you know, really trying to uh, shore up support among members, many of whom who have already come out in support uh, endorsing the vice president, uh, but certainly understanding uh, that she may have more work to do uh, to shore, fully shore up that support uh, from congressional Democrats uh, as she seeks to uh, become the nominee. That said, Nancy had mentioned the name Joe Manchin. What are you learning from sources about the appetite of coalescing behind Harris versus an open primary? Well, I think, you know, that is something that uh, remains to be seen. There have certainly been uh, some calls for an open primary or a mini primary of sorts. Uh, but I can tell you, having just uh, gotten off of a call with uh, organizers unrelated um, to the Hill, I, I would note that, and this is a key constituency group uh, in support uh, of the Biden-Harris uh, administration agenda, you know, the point was also made that this really is a time to try to unite that there is not a whole lot of time uh, to move forward in the sense of, you know, names have to be printed on ballots uh, and also understanding that it's important to uh, try to elevate uh, someone to the nominee position as soon as possible, again, so that the party can move forward. Nicole Killian, thank you. Let's bring in CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Brennan. She's also moderator of Face the Nation. And Margaret, you spoke with Senator Manchin today, this morning. He said, don't look at me, nothing to see here, how much can change. Um, what are your sources telling you about his current mindset and what would have to happen for him to throw his name in? Well, independent Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, remember, he just recently left the Democratic Party. He's been harshly critical of it, saying that it has lost touch with working class Americans uh, in particular. He was making the case on Face the Nation that he thinks this is a problem. At the time, he was talking about Joe Biden stepping aside. When I asked him, would he support Kamala Harris, he said, not unless there was a change in platform. And when I said, well, what about you? Would you be interested in running as vice president or running at all? And he said, don't look at me, time for a new generation. Well, you're right, a lot changed from about 1040 this morning until this evening when we did see President Joe Biden say he was not running for reelection and then automatically endorsed his vice president. And that endorsement has rubbed some Democrats the wrong way, who, who want to see more of a competition rather than, as one said to me, a coronation of Kamala Harris. Uh, and, and there is frustration at that. So I would put Joe Manchin in that category uh, in now saying he wants to reevaluate uh, what we have been told, myself and, and a number of our CBS uh, correspondents, is that Joe Manchin is receiving calls from donors interested in somebody who is more of the uh, sort of old centrist Democrat, though he left the party. First thing on the to-do list would be to rejoin the Democratic Party if he actually wanted to uh, throw his hat in the ring. But there are real questions about process here. And frankly, whether or not he ends up actually running, this is a this is a um, mechanism by which to force a conversation within the party about what does a winning ticket look like can a winning ticket have Vice President Kamala Harris uh, at the top of it? And on Face the Nation earlier, it was Joe Manchin who said, look at the governor of Kentucky, Andy Bashir, look at the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, Josh Shapiro, as candidates he thought had shown they could work across the aisle because they are Democratic governors in states that have to deal with Republican legislatures. That really seems to be the rub here, the, the ability to work across the aisle. That's going to be one of the criticisms of uh, Vice President Harris is, is, does she have that record of being able to work across the aisle, or will she just fit in the mold of a progressive California Democrat? That, that is why this conversation uh, was generated in, in the past few hours. Margaret, I know you're also tracking international reaction from world leaders. What have been some of the responses that have stood out to you? 
Well, from around the world, we have seen statements issued by prime ministers uh, from the United Kingdom to Russia, uh, Russia notably jumping on the disinformation campaign and repeating what sound an awful lot like some of the criticisms we've heard from Republicans in this country, which is to claim that there was a conspiracy here to cover up the true nature of Joe Biden's mental state uh, and to say that journalists were part of some great conspiracy. That, that's the talking point out of the Kremlin overnight, uh, and you have seen that amplified. So this is a question, frankly, that um, the Democrats will have to answer for. It's exactly when was it persuasive that you needed to come to this extreme measure of four months out from an election, switching out the top of the ticket. Was it just June 27th and that debate, a debate that Democrats asked to have because they wanted to inject some energy into the conversation by showing that the president could be quick on his feet and sh sharp on the issues, uh, something that backfired and then just over the past three weeks has led to this very painful process for Joe Biden himself and for Democrats who are openly uh, in disarray about this. At least this Sunday, we have uh, a conclusion to, to the question of whether Joe Biden could stay in the race or not. We still don't know um, just how competitive Kamala Harris will be at the top of the ticket. We know coming into this weekend, the CBS polling had shown that she was uh, about behind three points in a hypothetical head-to-head -head with Donald Trump. But that is something that world leaders will continue to watch. And we know, even just this week, one world leader, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, expected here Tuesday, will meet with President Biden and Vice President Harris. He'll speak to Congress. And there are open questions of, will he, he go and meet with Donald Trump? You are seeing world leaders try to hedge their bets here, build relationships with what could be an incoming administration, and openly wondering, what does that mean for the world? Margaret Brennan, thank you.